Now, today's presentation really is designed to open a discussion of the limits of executive power that's created by the Constitution and the abuses that I believe existed during the Civil War and exercised by President Lincoln. My purpose today is not to denigrate Lincoln, but rather to demonstrate that we as Americans must continue to be vigilant and to protect against the types of abuses that were permitted in the name of necessity and justice by the most revered president in our history. Now to appreciate the difficulty of the problem requires a brief but an important review of two provisions of the Constitution. The first provision I refer to is the presidential oath of office found in Article 2, Section 7, in which the president is required to state, I do solemnly swear that I will preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Close quote. The second provision in the Constitution that's important today is Article 1, Section 9, Paragraph 2. The privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it. Now we'll come back to this provision later as we discuss its particular location in the Constitution, which becomes a very significant fact. The history of habeas corpus is that, is, amongst, is that it is among the most important rights to be protected for civil society to function. In its simplest form, it simply requires that any person arrested has a right to be charged and to know what violation he's accused of committing so that he can mount a defense against those charges with the end result of a trial by one's peers. It has its origins as early as the Middle Ages and it appears again in 1215 in the Magna Carta where the petitioners provided that no one was to be imprisoned or deprived of liberty except by, quote, the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land, close quote. No right provided by the Constitution or restriction on government interference or action is more important and has been more cherished than the right of habeas corpus. The writ of, was not suspended when the British invaded and burned the city of Washington in the War of 1812. It was not used by President Wilson during World War I in the face of mounting opposition World War, to the war. It was not used by President Roosevelt in World War II despite the use of the Japanese internment camps, and it was not used by President Bush after 9-11. Only Abraham Lincoln, the defender of the Union, the great emancipator, and the world's best last hope for democracy felt it necessary to suspend the writ of habeas corpus, which is, the, which is really the subject of our discussion today. Now, Fort Sumter was attacked by the rebel forces on April 15, 1861. On that day, Lincoln issued a proclamation in which he stated that by virtue of the power granted to him as the um, commander in chief, he ordered the militias of the several states to be called up to provide 75,000 troops for immediately. He also ordered that Congress be convened in special session together on July 4, 1861. Virginia then voted to secede two days later on the 17th of April. The geographical consequences meant that the only way federal troops and supplies could reach the capital was through the state of Maryland, a state well known to be populated by large numbers of rebel sympathizers. On April 19th, a mob attacked troops when a Massachusetts regiment passed through Baltimore on the way to Washington. Maryland Governor Thomas Hicks had authorized the destruction of bridges connecting Baltimore to the northern states. Vigilantes destroyed telegraph lines and severed critical communications with Washington, and rumors were rampant that Robert E. Lee would soon invade Maryland. Lincoln and his cabinet were fearful that the Maryland legislature, which was now convening in the capital in Annapolis, was going to vote for secession. The cabinet debated whether Lincoln should order the arrest of the members of that body, and Lincoln rejected that suggestion and said that in order to protect the city, he would make his first of numerous controversial executive orders. On April 25, 1861, he wrote to Lieutenant General Winfield Scott, who was in command of the troops in which he described the fears that Maryland legislatures would take the steps to turn the people of the state against the United States. He determined that it would not be justifiable to arrest or disperse the members of that body because they clearly had a right to assemble. And one, of course, wouldn't know in advance 
as to whether or not their react what the reaction would be. So we therefore wrote, I therefore conclude, he wrote to Scott, that Scott should watch and await the action of the legislature. And if the legislature should decide to arm their people against the United States, then General Scott was, quote, to adopt the most prompt and efficient means to counteract, even if necessary, to the bombardment of their cities and in the extremest necessary, necessary, the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus, close quote. Thus, for the first time in American history, the President of the United States not only assumed the authority to suspend the writ of habeas corpus, and then give the ultimate discretionary authority to determine its use and necessity to a general in the army. Later, Lincoln again wrote to Scott, and he authorized Scott to determine whether at any point in the vicinity of the military line between New York and Washington, you find resistance, which renders it necessary to suspend the writ of habeas corpus for the public safety, you personally or through your officers in command are authorized to suspend that writ." Close quote. In the meantime, the President and the Cabinet believed that the situation in Baltimore was deteriorating rapidly, and it was believed that the Mayor and City Council were participating in actions that would interfere with the troop movements, as well as communications between Baltimore and Washington. General Benjamin Butler entered Baltimore on May 13, 1861, with 1,000 federal soldiers and not only ordered the imposition of martial law, but also ordered that the mayor and the members of the city council, the police commissioner and militia officers were arrested and imprisoned at Fort McHenry. <coughs> this is where the story gets interesting. One of the militia officers that was arrested was a man by the name of John Merriman. Now Butler was acting under the orders and authority of General Scott and the executive order that I referred to or earlier permitting the imposition of martial law and the suspension of the writ. Merriman would challenge his arrest and the suspension of the writ and the case would become synonymous with the attempt by the president to exercise such powers and it would also provide a confrontation that Lincoln had long sought to avoid with the Supreme Court. Since it was under the direction of Chief Justice Roger Tawney, the author of the infamous Dred Scott decision. Merriman was born in 1824 in Baltimore County and prior to the Civil War had been a lieutenant in the Baltimore <laughs> County Militia. He did participate under General Hicks's order in destruction of several bridges to prevent troops from moving from Philadelphia. And it was on May 25, 1861, that he was arrested by Union soldiers at 2 a.m. at his home and taken to confinement in Fort McHenry. You may have seen the signs for Fort McHenry as you go over the Delaware Memorial Bridge, it's still there. The fort was under command of, George, of General George Cadwalader, and the general received Merriman after he was arrested under the orders of a Pennsylvania general who believed that Merriman was a traitor, had burned bridges, and was involved in the training of rebel officers. Within hours after his arrest, Merriman's attorneys filed a petition for the issuance of a writ of habeas corpus, and they did that in the United States District Court in Maryland. In the petition, his attorneys alleged that no warrant had been issued to authorize his arrest and no legal process was utilized to hold him into custody. It was also alleged that Merriman was arrested because he had, quote, uttered and advanced secession doctrines, close quote. Coincidentally or not, Chief Justice Tawney was the presiding judge of the, of the court and he granted the petition and the writ was issued and needed to be served on the general. Now, the writ of habeas corpus required the general to appear in circuit court the next day with Merriman, which would exp to explain his reasons for holding the prisoner in custody. The general refused to appear, but instead sent the letter to the Chief Justice on May 27th that Merriman was charged with treason and, quote, armed hostility against the government, close quote. In addition, the general replied that the President of the United States had authorized military officers to suspend the writ of habeas corpus when required for public safety. The general also requested uh, for a delay in the hearing. Of course, the Chief Justice refused to delay the case and issued an order that the general be held in contempt of court for refusing to bring Merriman to the court. <coughs> 
and when the deputy federal marshal went to Fort McHenry to serve the order, the guard barred his entrance and replied, no one was there to accept the document. Now, we cannot fail to recognize that Justice Taney, as the author of the Dred Scott decision, who declared that black men were not citizens of the United States and therefore could not have access to the federal courts, the same Justice Taney that declared the Missouri Compromise unconstitutional. He was a native of Maryland and a sympathizer with the southern states as late as the spring of 1861. <coughs> His opinion in this case was written not as the circuit judge, but as the Chief Justice of the United States. And before a packed courtroom, he announced that the President of the United States had no constitutional or statutory authority to suspend the writ of habeas corpus, and that when a military officer arrested a civilian, that that officer had to deliver the person to the civil authorities. He declared that Merriman was entitled to immediate release from imprisonment. And the opinion of the court went on through the basic facts of the case and noted that a warrant was requested to be produced and it was refused. He said that Merriman had been arrested on general charges of treason and rebellion. No witnesses' names were provided. No proof was offered in support of the allegations and no specifications as to the particular acts he was accused of committing uh, uh, as crimes of treason. He noted that the general's answer to the petition of the writ of habeas corpus is that, quote, he's authorized by the president to suspend the writ and that in the exercise of that discretion, he does suspend it in this case and refuses obedience to the writ of habeas corpus, close quote. Tawney went on to write in his written opinion that it was his understanding, quote, the president not only claims the right to suspend the writ of habeas corpus himself at his discretion, but further to delegate that discretionary power to a military officer and to leave it to him to determine whether or not he will obey judicial process that may be served on him." Close quote. It was his opinion that the privilege of the writ could not be suspended except by an act of Congress. It was Tawney's opinion and he clearly stated, quote, the president has exercised a power which he does not possess under the Constitution. Close quote. In particular, he noted that the suspension privilege is located in Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution, which is devoted to the legislative branch of the United States and has not the slightest reference to the executive. He noted further that the writ could only be suspended in cases of invasion or rebellion and then only, quote, when the public safety shall require it. It was his opinion, therefore, that Congress was required to make that determination, not the president. Tawney went on to write that there was nothing in the organization of the executive department that one can conclude the ground to justify the exercise of the power claimed by Lincoln. The Chief Justice then went on to reason that even if the privilege of habeas corpus was suspended by Congress and a party who is not subject to the rules of war was afterwards arrested, he could not be detained and tried before a military tribunal because the Sixth Amendment guaranteed trial by jury in the state where the crime had been committed. Moreover, the defendant was to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation and be confronted with witnesses, as set forth in the Sixth Amendment. The laws, Justice Tawney claimed, are required to be faithfully carried out by the president, and he's not authorized to execute them himself or through his agents, officers, civil or military. He must act in subordination to judicial authority. Tawney concluded that Lincoln does not faithfully execute the office, uh, the orders, the laws, excuse me, if he takes it upon himself to assume the legislative power as well as the judicial power by arresting and imprisoning a person without due process. And finally, he concluded one of the most important items to consider that at the time the civilian courts were in session and could easily have had Merriman transferred to its jurisdiction, whereupon he would have been released if there was not sufficient evidence to support the accusation. There was no danger, he wrote, to the action of the civil authorities, and therefore there was no reason for the interposition of the military. Despite that, a military officer assumed to himself the judicial power in the District of Maryland and the right to decide what constitutes the crime of treason, and rebellion and all other facts and charges. He did not order Merriman released, but instead directed that a copy of the opinion be delivered to the president. 
and then it remained in the president in pursuance of his constitutional obligation to determine what measure he would take, quote, to cause the civil process of the United States to be respected and enforced, close quote. Lincoln ignored Tawney's opinion and his admonitions. Merriman remained in custody at the fort and was later indicted finally by a grand jury in 1861 along with about 60 other participants in the, in the conspiracy. He never went to trial. He was finally released on bail some months later and President Johnson, when he became president, uh, thereafter instructed the Attorney General to release all of the prisoners without trial or charges. Despite Tawney's admonition, Lincoln issued subsequent executive orders authorizing his military staff to suspend the writ and authorizing the commanding generals in the various districts to permit any officers under their jurisdiction to do the same. On Ju June 20th, 1861, on July 2nd, 1861, additional executive orders were given by him allowing for the suspension of the writ wherever and whenever they saw fit. On October 14th, he, he authorized General Scott to suspend the writ from Washington to Bangor, Maine. On December 2nd, 1861, he authorized General Halleck to suspend habeas corpus in the entire state of Missouri. On April 5, 1862, he authorized General Dix to completely take over the civilian control of Baltimore, remove all the civil police, declare martial law, arrest and imprison disloyal persons, and suspend the writ of habeas corpus anywhere that he thought was necessary. In the meantime, Lincoln, as I told you, had uh, scheduled a speech before a joint session of Congress for July 4th, 1861, in which he discussed the reasons for the war, the resistance offered by the government, the necessity to continue the war, and of course, reference to the, to the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. Nevertheless, he said, he recognized that the priority of what he had done was questioned. But he assured Congress that he had given the matter some consideration. But Lincoln stated that he did not believe that any law was violated. He claimed that, quote, it was decided we have a case of rebellion and that the public safety does require the qualified suspension of the privilege of the writ, close quote. In challenging the question as to whether the executive branch or Congress had the right and power to suspend the writ, he noted, quote, the Constitution itself is silent as to which or who is to exercise the power. It cannot believe, be believed, he said, that the framers of the instrument intended that in every case the danger should run its course until Congress could be called together, the various sampling of which might be prevented, as was intended in this case by the rebellion, close quote. In other words, he believed that it was important to have speed and uh, alacrity in making this determination and to wait for Congress to do, to do that would simply be an impairment, uh, an impairment to the fighting of the war. The next day, as promised by Lincoln, the Attorney General of the United States, Edward Bates, issued an opinion supporting the President. Particularly, he addressed the authority of the President to suspend the writ. He wrote that it's the plain duty of the President to preserve the Constitution and that it, quote, is impossible for him to perform this duty without putting down the rebellion to resist the, go the general government, close quote. Addressing the issues raised by Taney, he noted that if the executive and the judiciary branches are considered to be coordinate departments of the government and not subordinate one to the other, he said, quote, I do not understand how it can be legally possible for a judge to command, to issue a command to the president to come before him, to submit implicitly to his judgment, and in the case of disobedience, treat him as a criminal in contempt of a superior authority, close quote. It was Bates's opinion that the whole matter was political and not judicial, and that the president, he claimed, is exclusively and eminently political in all his principal functions, and as the political chief of the Constitution, it char charges him with its preservation, close quote. The judiciary department, he said, has no political powers, and therefore no court or judge can take cognizance of the political acts of the president, or undertake to reverse his political decisions." Close quote. Lincoln and his general staff continued to issue orders suspending the writ until the entire United States was covered by some sort of order for martial law or suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. 
Thousands of individuals were arrested and detained under the orders, and hundreds of businesses and organizations were shut down simply by raising a dissenting voice against the conduct of the war. In September of 1862, the president, by way of proclamation, ordered that any person that discouraged volunteer enlistments or resisted the draft or was guilty of any disloyal practice which gave aid and comfort to the rebels were subject to martial law and thus trial, by punish trial and punishment by courts martial or military commissioners and that the writ of habeas corpus is suspended with respect to all persons so arrested or that were imprisoned in any fort. In 1863, Clement Vallandigham, a 42-year-old former Democrat member of Congress from Ohio, had joined the Copperheads, the opponents to the war, and had frequently spoken out against the practices of the president as well as the conduct of the war. He criticized Lincoln for the approaching war. He supported Stephen Douglas against Lincoln's election, and he was finally defeated for Congress in 1862. But by 1863, he began to tour the state of Ohio and speak against the war at public rallies. Particularly, he spoke out against an order by General Burnside, which included restrictions on speech, and the order said that the military would no longer tolerate any further declaration or sympathies with the enemy, and that any act of expressed or implied treason would be subject to military court and punishment. Naturally, on May 1st, Burnside sent observers to a speech that Vallandigham was giving before 20,000 people. And as a result, on May 5th, 1860, soldiers broke down the door of his home and took him into custody. He was taken by special train to, to a military prison in Cincinnati, where he was charged with defying the order by publicly expressing sympathies for the rebels. Vallandigham challenged the authority of the military commission, alleging that he had been arrested without due process and there or any warrant, and that the military had no jurisdiction over him because he was a civilian. But by 5 p.m. on May 7th, the commission returned a verdict of guilty, and he was sentenced to prison for the, entire, for the duration of the war. When Vallandigham sought a writ of habeas corpus from the courts, the presiding judge ruled that it had already been suspended in Ohio and therefore was not available to him. Riots erupted and waves of protest all over the state of Ohio were initiated against the treatment given to this former congressman. And finally, Lincoln commuted his sentence and he was changed to banishment beyond the military lines, a penalty that I can't find duplicated anywhere else in American jurisprudence. Vallandigham was delivered to the Confederates then in Tennessee. Eventually, though, he evaded the blockades in the Union. He sailed to Bermuda, worked his way back up to Windsor, Ontario, and eventually was nominated in absentia to run for governor of Ohio. And while in Canada, he appealed to the Supreme Court of the United States, who concluded that it had no jurisdiction to review the commission's decision. In violation of his order of banishment, he returned to Ohio and attended the Democratic Convention, and Lincoln just threw up his hands and let him go without any further process. But perhaps the most bizarre case occurred near the end of the war and really was not decided until the war was over. Landon Milligan, an attorney from Belmont County, Ohio, whose father had been a soldier in the Revolutionary War, became the focus of another famous arrest. He publicly protested the war against the Confederacy and it was believed that he was involved in a conspiracy against the United States at the end of 1863. Milligan had been bedridden with a horrific skin disease with his left leg becoming useless. And despite that, on October 5, 1864, at about 4 a.m., most of these arrests happened in the middle of the night, you notice, uh, soldiers under the order of General Hovey went to Milligan's house, ordered him out of bed, ordered him to walk even though his leg was paralyzed. Charges against Milligan and others included conspiracy against the United States, providing aid and comfort to the rebels, inciting insurrection, disloyal practices, and violation of the laws of war. It was alleged at that time that, there was a, that he was part of a conspiracy to plan and steal weapons and to break into forts and free Confederate prisoners. He and the other alleged conspirators were tried before military tribunals in Indiana, starting October 21, 1864. 
By December 6, 1864, they were convicted and sentenced to death by hanging. And the execution was set for May 19th, 1865. Of course, by April 1865, Lincoln had been assassinated and President Johnson was presented with the case and confirmed the death sentences. However, he was later presented with a request for commutation of the sentences and he did commute the sentences to life as the men claimed that they should never have been tried by military courts. By way of coincidence, Milligan had written a personal note to Secretary of War Stanton on December 28th in which he said, quote, I've been condemned to die without evidence. Please examine the facts and advise the president. Do this much for an old acquaintance and friend, close quote. Actually, the two of them had gone to law school together um, and Milligan was calling upon Stanton to renew that friendship. Stanton never replied before Lincoln's assassination. The case wound its way through the courts when Milligan petitioned for writ of habeas corpus in Indiana. And the question of his trial was then certified to the Supreme Court. Here, the, co the court's opinion was provided by Justice Davis, who coincidentally had been appointed by Lincoln and was a close friend and campaign manager of Lincoln in the 1860 election. One of Milligan's lawyers, just parenthetically, was James A. Garfield, who was later to become president of the United States. The Supreme Court unanimously held that Lincoln had gone too far. Since Indiana, where the trial was held, was never under attack, and Milligan was not connected with the Confederate military service, he was not a prisoner of war. He was arrested at home, and the courts in Indiana were opening and functioning. The Supreme Court determined that the government could have charged him with treason and tried him in the courts in Indiana, where he would have had the right to a jury and a fair trial under the Constitution. The eloquence of the opinion of Davis cannot be understated when he writes, quote, it is the birthright of every American citizen when charged with crime to be tried and punished according to law. He goes on to say that if there, if there were law to justify his military trial, it is not our province to interfere. If there was not, then it is our duty to declare the nullity of the whole proceeding. Indiana, the court said, could not have been the subject of martial law because martial law cannot arise from a threatened invasion. The necessity must be actual and present. The invasion has to be real and as effectually closes the courts and deposes the civil administration, close quote. The Supreme Court went on to distinguish between the threats of danger and the threat of invasion and the actuality which would impede the process of the courts. Martial rule can never exist where the courts are open and in the proper and unobstructed exercise of their jurisdiction, he wrote. The court unequivocally stated that Milligan's trial was illegal as conducted by a military commission. Milligan was released from prison and in 1865, he filed a civil suit against General Hovey and others responsible for his military imprisonment. He asked for damages in the astronomical sum of $500,000. The Indiana legislature, legislature passed a law that put a limit of $5 on the amount of damages which he did recover. He returned to practice law in Indiana and finally died in 1899 at the age of 87. I must point out to you that Lincoln made one other significant attempt to justify the conduct of the war when he responded to a New York State legislative group inquiry as to the justification for all of the suspensions of civil liberties that they had witnessed and in particular, the writ of suspending the writ of habeas corpus. In response to these several demands by this group, on June 12, 1863, Lincoln wrote a letter to Erastus Corning in New York State to attempt to explain his actions. He disagreed with the military arrests and proceedings, that the military arrests and proceedings were unconstitutional. He argued that it was a proper exercise of his executive authority to suspend the writ to avoid the, quote, ruinous waste of time, close quote, as are likely to occur. He said that he was slow to adopt the strong measures which he had been forced to do. Quote, civil courts are organized chiefly for trials of individuals or at most a few individuals acting in concert and in quiet times and on charges of crimes well defined in the law, close quote. But famously, Lincoln wrote, quote, he who dissuades one man from volunteering or induces one soldier to desert, weakens the Union cause as much as he who kills a Union soldier in battle." Close quote. 
And he finally concluded, must I shoot a simple-minded soldier boy who deserts while I must not touch the hair of a wily agitator who induces him to desert? Close quote. He added that in such a case, to silence the agitator and save the boy is not only constitutional, but with all a great mercy. If habeas corpus, were, Lincoln wrote, were allowed to operate, then all of those who were arrested would most probably have been discharged. He was convinced, he said, the time not unlikely to come when I shall be blamed for having made too fewer arrests than too many. Too many. On March 3, 1863, Congress finally gave Lincoln what he needed. Thousands of citizens by this time had been seized by the military and were confined to military prisons and were tried by military commissions. The 1863 Habeas Corpus Act authorized the president to suspend the writ in the case throughout the United States whenever, in his judgment, the public safety required it. Certainly, the statute did not justify any prior actions by Lincoln, nor did it attempt even to approve retroactively what was done. Lincoln acted on the new law by expanding the use of the restrictions on free speech, dissent, and of course the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. The army, however, interpreted the Congressional Act as inapplicable to persons triable by court-martial and military commissions. At the end of the war, President Johnson and the military commissioners eventually released most, if not all, of the political prisoners who were returned to their families. Nearly 14,000 Americans had been imprisoned by this time. Now there is one last executive order of Lincoln that cannot be ignored in this discussion. Lincoln had learned that black soldiers had been, that had been captured by rebel forces were being mistreated and even sold back into slavery, and that even white soldiers were being mistreated, both of which he considered a relapse into barbarism and a crime against civilization. He then ordered, quote, for every soldier killed in violation of the laws of war, a rebel soldier shall be executed. And for every enslaved by the enemy or sold into slavery, a rebel soldier shall be placed at hard labor on the public works. This was the law of retaliation. The rapid and unprecedented expansion of executive authority and power unfortunately did not end with the Civil War. In fact, subsequent presidents have engaged in battles and wars and assumed war powers and other domestic powers that were never enumerated in the Constitution, but were assumed to be within the president's authority. The total number of executive orders issued by Lincoln numbered 48. And while by today's standard, that's certainly not a great number, nevertheless, it far exceeded anything that had been issued by the previous 15 presidents. The apparent abuse of power that we observed in the Lincoln administration began a trend in both peacetime as well as wartime presidents that has not yet diminished, but appears to be spiraling beyond our control. Significantly, no president before or since Lincoln has ever suspended the writ of habeas corpus or has taken the overt steps that Lincoln took to, to curb dissent or restrict the rights of Americans. And while subsequent presidents use the authority uh, of the executive order and executive powers to increase executive authority as the nation grew into the 20th century, no president ever made such broad use again until Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt's commitment to the 20th century progressivism was reflected in his role as he saw it as the president. His extensive use of executive authority resulted in at least in 1,081 executive orders, orders, ranging from massive reform of the civil service system to environmental development of public lands, as well as a host of appointments, sub-agencies, and commissions that he sought to create to provide government services to all Americans. Theodore Roosevelt believed that presidential power was, quote, subject only to the people. And under the Constitution, the president was bound to serve the people affirmatively. And in cases where the Constitution does not explicitly forbid him to render that service, close quote. If the Constitution says, doesn't say that I can't do it, then I can do it. Among the 1800 orders issued by President Wilson was the seizure of all radio stations within the jurisdiction of the United States that had the power to make transatlantic broadcasts. Before the war even started, before the, uh, the US war was at war to ensure our neutrality. On the other hand, 
Wilson declined to use his executive authority or power when he learned that many government agencies, including the Post Office Department and the Treasury Department, had specific orders to segregate employees among those departments. But the king of all executive powers remains with Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who issued over 3,500 executive orders during his several terms of office, albeit during the worst parts of the Depression, and of course during World War II. It is during Roosevelt's term, however, that we see perhaps the greatest abuse of power that's, that exceeded even Lincoln's suspension of habeas corpus. The most famous of Roosevelt's orders was Executive Order 9066, in which the President authorized the Secretary of Commerce and the Secretary of War, uh, I'm sorry, the Secretary of War and military commanders to issue resettle, to resettle residents in the United States military designated areas in order to secure the security of the country. This was the author authorization that the Secretary of War and the Army needed to establish Japanese internment camps in the Midwest, resulting in the resettlement of Japanese citizens and residents who were removed from their homes in a 50 to 60 mile wide area, starting from the state of Washington down to California and into Arizona. The same executive order and other wartime orders ordered by Roosevelt were applied to citizens of Italian and German descent. And while most Americans don't realize it, 3,200 resident aliens of Italian background were arrested, and 300 of them were sent to internment camps. 11,000 German residents were arrested, and more than 5,000 were imprisoned, or interned, excuse me. In the famous case of Korematsu versus the United States, the court upheld this order holding that the country was at war and that hardships are part of war. Moreover, the court was deferring its decision to that of the military and said that it was difficult or if not impossible to bring about an immediate segregation of the disloyal from the loyal. It therefore upheld this move. Of course, Roosevelt later withdrew the order and in 1988, the United States Congress apologized to the Japanese Americans and made financial restitution to surviving family matters, members. In 1952, we saw again the presidential powers being used in excess. The nation was involved in a police action in Korea. And although American soldiers were involved in fighting and dying in Korea, Congress had not declared war. In the meantime, labor unrest existed within the steel industry and President Truman was of the opinion that a strike would cause severe problems um, in fighting the, the, the Korean War and the ability of the nation to carry on the war. Rather than use some of the legal machinations that were available to him by labor statutes, Truman issued an executive order, number 10340, which authorizes and directed the Secretary of, of Commerce to take possession of and seize the steel mills in the United States and to keep them running. Congress took no action in response to this seizure. The steel companies then obtained an injunction preventing the government from continuing to hold on to the steel plants. The government appealed that to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court cited the presidential war powers that were argued that were inherent in the president's authority. The court noted, however, that war had not been declared by Congress and that Truman far exceeded his presidential authority. The reasons by, expressed by the court really involve four different areas of constitutional authority, and frankly, we don't have enough time to go into each of them, but suffice it to say that the court determined that there was no inherent presidential power to do what Truman did, and that the president should not act unless there's an express authority to do so. After Truman's presidency, from Eisenhower to Kennedy and Johnson, from Korea to Vietnam, to Grenada, to Panama, to Iraq and Afghanistan, from Nixon and Reagan and Bush and Clinton, and right today until the President, uh, President Obama, we see a greater and more expansive use of executive orders, so-called inherent pres presidential powers, the appointment of department czars to oversee agencies. We have seen attempts by all of these presidents to skirt around the authority of Congress to amend laws by rulemaking and executive order. Just recently, President Obama has threatened to use, quote, his pen, close quote, if Congress fails to do what he deems necessary for America. We can point to executive orders and authority that change or alter legislation. 
Throughout all these years, both Democrats and Republicans of Cong in Congress have remained silent as there has, been not, there has not been a major challenge to any president with respect to these powers since the Truman case. Of course, the Nixon-Watergate scandal and the Clinton impeachment scandals gave greater credibility to the limitations of presidential powers and immunity. That has not, however, led to a diminution of the inherent executive powers that presidents have sought. How far this goes, ladies and gentlemen, depends upon the American citizens and the maintaining of a vigilance and should, that we should be debating and discussing these issues and how our Congress representatives have remained silent throughout all these years. It is easier, of course, if you're a congressman, to blame the president when Congress remains silent for any problems that arise. The end of this story that I've told today is yet to be written, but I'm reminded of the admonition of Montesquieu, the architect of the separation of powers in American government. Quote, constant experience shows us that every man invested with power is apt to abuse it and to carry his authority as far as it will go. When the legislative and the executive powers are united in the same person, there can be no liberty. There would be an end of everything were the same man or same body to exercise these three powers, that of enacting the laws, executing the public real resolutions, and of trying the causes of individuals." Close quote. The importance of this discussion can be summed up by Justice Davis way back in the Milligan case. Quote, the Constitution of the United States is a, rule, is a law for rulers and for people, equally in war and in peace, and covers with the shield of its protection all classes of men at all times and under all circumstances. Thank you very much.